May I have your attention, please? Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to this special occasion as we celebrate another milestone in the life of one of our academic colleagues and also in the, on the journey of the University Jamaica Press and the academic life here at the University of Jamaica, University of Technology Jamaica. We're very happy to have all of you here. There are some persons who are on their way, and I'm sure they'll be here in short order. However, in the interest of time, we will start. Thank you very much for making it here. I think it's appropriate at this time to ask for divine blessing on our event this evening. And so I'm going to call on a faculty member, colleague, Mrs. Camille Jackson, lecturer in the College of Business and Management. Mrs. Jackson. Ms. Jackson. I was about to... Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Can we stand for prayer? Let us pray. Good and loving God, we thank you for the opportunity to gather here this evening. Thank you for every seat that has been filled here today. We commit this event in your hands. As we celebrate the work of your servant, Paul Golding, we thank you for instilling in him the ideas that are penned in this book. We pray that this labor of love for educating the population will resonate with everyone who reads this book. We dedicate his work to you and pray that it will inspire others to add their voices to the academic sphere. We thank you for allowing him to see the fruits of his labor and we continue to ask for you to inspire him. Lord, we are thankful for the persons here who have assisted in seeing him through this project. We ask for your choicest blessing upon all of them. We commit the entire program in your hands and pray that everything will be bring you glory and honor. In your name we pray, amen. Thank you very much, Miss Jackson. Uh, there are a number of persons who will be joining us, as I said um, shortly, uh, supporters of the cause, very close friend of our author. And um, at the outset, may I apologize for the absence of our acting president, Professor Colin Giles, who has to be out of town uh, at a funeral of a family member. Uh, we hope that all goes well with him and his family at this time. We are very grateful for the support of a number of persons. Uh, some will be joining us, as I said, and I'll just acknowledge them at this time uh, so that we get all of the preliminaries out of the way to hear more about the book, the author, and to see how many sale how many persons will be buying this afternoon? We're very grateful for Dr. Paul Ivey. He's a manager of UTEC Jamaica Press, as you all know, and I'm sure he's very happy to celebrate this milestone. Attorney at law, Mr. Lloyd McFarlane. Thank you for joining us, sir. Um, and we have members from the Jamaica Baptist Union here. We support. I'm not too sure Paul has been a Baptist all his life, but um, Reverend Winston McKay and also Reverend Glenroy Layla uh, from the Jamaica Baptist Union. I should uh, later on we'll hear more about our keynote keynote spoke speaker. Um, I get tongue twisted, Gary, when I think of um, the many things that you have achieved and the mentor that you have been to so many 
in such a short time, but we'll talk more about that later. We're so very happy that you're here, and, I, and Professor Golden and the team uh, have selected a very, very appropriate keynote speaker for this, for this afternoon. Um, we should be joined by another longtime friend who is currently Executive Director of the Broadcasting Commission, Mr. Cordell Green, and um, Martin Henry's family. We are very happy that you have joined us. Uh, Martin Henry uh, was a project manager here at UTEC, and he uh, was the first manager for the press, uh, did a very good job in the life of the university, and um, he passed on unexpectedly a few years ago, and we're very honored to have the company of his wife, uh, Mrs. Jacqueline Henry, and the firstborn, uh, Miss Laurie Henry. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, I'm looking for the former registrars who promised to be here. So I hope they come in short order, uh, Ms. Elaine Wallace and Mrs. Mercedes Dean. And we'll also hear from um, another strong supporter of the cause, uh, Dr. Andrea Sutherland. You'll hear more about her later. The, the, the deaf community, uh, to which our author, Professor Golden, is very close and who has worked. And for those who are here, a special welcome to you. Special guests, you take Jamaica community. We always support each other. Love you. So happy to have you. And Paul's son. <laughs> Thank you for coming, sir. All right. All right. Uh, mine is not the job to speak much this afternoon, except to introduce a few special persons. And before we go any further, I think it's appropriate for us to hear uh, from the manager of the press. So I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Paul Ivey to bring a few remarks. Thank you, Mr. Wheeler. I adopt the protocol that you outlined earlier. And so good afternoon, everyone. I want to recognize as well Mr. Gary Hallin, our guest speaker for this afternoon, the CEO of the RJR Gleaner Communications Group, members of the UTEC family who are here, ladies and gentlemen, and other distinguished persons, and of course, our author, Professor Golden. Thank you for being here. You know, let me start my remarks with a recent experience I have, which encapsulates what a manager of the press does. We were having a committee meeting recently, and the co a new course of study was under discussion. It was a course in midwifery. And I asked the question, men who pursue that profession, are they also called midwives? And the answer was in the affirmative, that yes, they are. And I'm saying that to say, being manager of the press is a bit like being a midwife. Because one is involved in giving birth to books such as this one. And so I find that situation and that analogy very apt. So my task is to give a bit of an overview of the UTEC Jamaica Press. And I want to start by saying that the UTEC Jamaica Press began operations in February of 2018 as a unit under the office of the president of the university. And as was mentioned a short while ago, our colleague and friend, dearly missed, Martin Henry was the first manager of the press. And in that regard, it is to be appreciated that I have 
large shoes to fill in terms of you know, the track record that he has as a high performer and a performer of excellence. The press and its inception was a brainchild of then President Professor Stephen Vassiani. He thought that the reputable big name universities of the world, the Oxfords, the Cambridges, and so on, they all have Harvard, Yale, they all have presses. So UTEC should likewise join the ranks of such institutions by having a press. For what purpose then, do you ask? The goal of the UTEC Jamaica Press is to promote research and publications, primarily among members of the university community, providing an avenue for academic staff and other members to publish the results of their research and to produce works that will bring together established as well as new knowledge. The specific objectives are to assist the UTEC community and external researchers and authors with their publishing needs and desires to further enhance the reputation of our university and our country, to contribute to increased research and publications in all fields of study for economic and scientific advancement, and to promote a culture of publishing and for scholarly work and for writing, and to abolish the canard that we are at oral culture, so that we now establish a culture of putting things in writing and put the scholarly works. Since its ex inception in 2018, the press has produced nine books, including the one we are going to be launching today. And the nine books are captured on this flyer, which you have copies of in your possession. And they are as follows. The very first book that was put out was titled The Jamaican Public Health System from the 17th to 21st Centuries, A Policy and Structural Perspective, which was authored by Dr. Adela Campbell, currently our Dean of the College of Health Sciences. The second title, I'm not going in order in which they were published, but just the list of from the one to the nine. Caribbean Essays on Policy and Law by no other person than Professor Stephen Vassiani, former president, and a distinguished scholar of international law. Third title, From Apprenticeship to Graduate Pharmacy Programs, the History of Pharmacy Education in Jamaica by Dr. Eugenie Brown Myrie and Mrs. Patrice Johnson Reed, also from the College of Health Sciences. And then we have this interesting title from My Trench Town Journey Lessons in Social Entrepreneurship by Dr. Enley Morgan from the Agency for Inner City Renewal. And persons will recall that Dr. Morgan a high-flying management consultant, folded his business in New Kingston and relocated to Trenchtown, the inner cities, and in the inner city. And here he has documented his journey in Trenchtown and what he has done in terms of activities to turn that uh, community around. And then we have, and this one came out in the midst of the pandemic, Preserving the Mental Health of Caregivers. And this was an edited volume by Dr. Andrea Pusey Murray from the College of Health Sciences with a number of chapter contributors. And this is an interesting title in terms of fatigue and other challenges that the persons that they call carers experience as caregivers. And then, Transformational Challenges in the 21st Century by Mr. Henry Lewis from the Faculty of Education and Liberal Studies. University Life and Learning, 
edited by Professor Fitzroy Henry from the College of Health Sciences as well. And when we come now to the next title, The Best Caribbean Foods to Combat Chronic Diseases. We know that Jamaica has an epidemic of NCDs. And here this particular title is as summarized or as compiled the best foods to eat to combat chronic diseases. And then we come to the book of the day. The first 20 years of the 21st century. Observations from Jamaica by Professor Paul Golden from the College of Business and Management. Ladies and gentlemen, what you will see, and you will agree with me, that collectively, these books represent a solid body of scholarship coming out of our university and befitting the standing of our institution. Thank you. So, as the manager, I have to drum up some sales. So the question arises immediately. I've told you of the nine titles. Where are they available? What are the marketing channels? The nine titles are primarily available through Amazon, the paperback formats. And the ebook formats are available on BookFusion. It is the case, though, that transformational challenges and Caribbean essays on law, on law and the policy, they are available in Sangster's bookstores and in the Norman Manley International Airport at one of those bookshops, CD books and more, those two titles. And all nine are available on Amazon. Then the question is, where is the press going in the future? What are some of the titles we have in the works? Well, are under consideration, are currently in production. We have an additional six titles under consideration. And here they are. Innovation policy, formulation and implementation for the socioeconomic transformation of developing states. This title, authored by Dr. Andrea Barrett from the College of Business and Management. The College of Business and Management seems to be recurring as it relates to, to these books. We also have the dynamics of Caribbean tourism, opportunities, challenges, and a reimagined future to be edited by Dr. Garnet Sinclair Mirage from the College of Business and Management. This one is interesting, as they all are. Dancehall Business Control Jamaica, how corporate sponsors bought into anti-gay lyrics. Author, Mr. Melville Cook, who is looking at me right there. <laughs> Chancellor, this is a compilation of the citations that have been read to honorary graduates of the University of Technology, Jamaica. This is a joint initiative between the press and our corporate communications unit. And then, here we go again. Common disease conditions, drug therapy cases for practice and review. Dr. Andrea Daly from our College of Health Sciences. Real world applications of marketing concepts through illustrated mini cases by Mr. Clinton McNeil from the College of Business and Management. So ladies and gentlemen, you see the press is very active and the titles and the subject matters that are under consideration are very relevant to our space and our context. So, I want to thank the members of the Press Advisory Board, chaired by our current acting president, Professor Colin Giles, and the other members comprising Professor Vernon Buchanan, Professor Fitzroy Henry, Dr. Camilla Hilton, looking at me from over yonder there. Dr. Andrew Lam, Dr. Marcia Williams, Dr. Martin Shade, Sis Marcia Jennings Cole. All of these are members of the Press Advisory Board. And I want to thank them for their support and their continued faith in the press and their confidence 
in retaining me as the manager. I also thank Ms. Grayson Black, publishing assistant, and Mr. Marlon Davis, who provides accounting support. I want to thank as well Mrs. Michelle Beckford and her team who have assisted with this uh, launch that we're having this afternoon. And the LTSU team under the leadership of Mr. Carlian Russell, as well as the Lillian's Restaurant for their um, provision of the refreshments that we will have later. And of course, for the uh, sponsor that is outside as well, which will be honorably mentioned later on. I'd also thank the procurement department and the chief business and finance officer, our printry as well, and the media services department of the Calvin McKean's library. In closing, I want to congratulate Professor Golden again on achieving this milestone, his first published book. As part of his career as an academic and public affairs commentator, he's a professor of business, of management, and information systems, the management side I want to comment on. We had some tough negotiations leading up to this afternoon, but at all times we were guided by the overarching goal of a win-win. And he said to me, and you know, he's Paul and I'm Paul. <laughs> and he would say, Paul, this is not win-win. I would say, Paul, that is the best I can do in the circumstances. You know, so we had some, but here we are, here we are. And so here we are today launching this very attractive book. Very, you will agree with me that it's very attractive. So they say never judge a book by its cover, but this one can be judged by its attractive cover. But knowing this scholarship that Professor Golden brings to the table, you can be assured that there's much to chew on beyond the cover. Uh, it's also, in addition to being attractive and informative, it is also attractively priced. And in that regard, I want to say to you that I, as an author myself, I must tell you that books make good Christmas gifts. <laughs> and so as we are getting into the Yuletide season, you, you can already check off your gift. One of your gifts, in terms of the bookworms in your family or in your circle, here's your gift that you'll be giving them. So please show your support by purchasing your copy today or afterwards. The advantage of purchasing today is that your copy will be autographed at no additional cost. <laughs> and I'm asking you also to support the other titles of the University of Technology Jamaica Press, and they are all available on Amazon, as I indicated. So thank you very much. And thank you for being here today. Thank you very much, Dr. Ivy. Uh, I'm sure some of us may be wondering what's so special about the 21st century and the first 21 years. And I think that will come as the evening goes by. And if not, you will get it from the book. In order to know a little more, you have to get into the head of the author. So we have to tell you who the author is, and he's a big man. So we, could, we, we have two persons to talk about him. <laughs> so I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Andrea Sutherland, who is the Dean of the College of Business and Management, as well as Dr. Lisa Facey Shaw, a lecturer in the School of Computing and Information Technology, to introduce the author to us. We'll start with Dr. Sutherland and then Dr. Shaw. All together. Mr. Chairman, 
Dr. Paul Ivey, Dean, um, Associate Vice, Pres Vice President um, for Research, Entrepreneurship, and Graduate Studies, Associate Deans, Heads of School, our esteemed guest speaker, Mr. Gary Allen, members of faculty, other members of staff, friends, family, Daniel, good evening, <laughs> welcome. So, you know, why two persons? But as the chairman indicated, it's a big man. Not big in stature, but we'll try to give you little snippets because if we were to give you everything, we'd be here all night, literally. <laughs> yes, that's another book, right? So for someone who is so accomplished, so multifaceted, and we'll just give you snippets of the various um, facets of him. So we're not going to go through the entire CV, but we'll look at the various, um, various areas and take you a little bit into this journey. The first 21 years of the 21st century, observations from Jamaica. So I will start with the academic aspect of this journey. As we have all been told this evening, Professor Paul Golden is currently a professor of management and information systems here at University of Technology, Jamaica, UTEC. And he's also an adjunct lecturer at the University of the West Indies, Mona. And you know, the interesting thing is he started out in business, then his teaching career took him to UTEC in the School of Computing and Information Technology where he was eventually the head of school. Then, of course, he migrated and came back home to business, <laughs> the College of Business and Management. We weren't too hard on him, we welcomed him home. And he served as our dean for eight years until 2019. So I'm gonna speak a little bit about his teaching journey and to let you know that his teaching focuses on courses in the information systems discipline. And one key teaching strategy that he incorporates into his classes is the use of teaching cases. Now, these are cases that would typically illustrate organizational issues for which the students are placed in the role of the decision maker. Now, generally, the cases that we use tend to be of North American origin. But over the last 15 years or so, Professor Golden has been very integral in authoring cases which reflect the Jamaican context. Yes? And these are cases that would cover the telecommunications industry, IT governance, and general information systems. Among the many that he has authored, includes the wireless war in Jamaica and the taste of lime, competitive dynamics and strategies in the telecommunications industry. And there's also the Grace Kennedy case, right? Speaking about IT governance. And so passionate is he about using cases that he is the founding president of the Caribbean Case Researchers Association and this is a group intended to develop a critical pool of local and regional writers, case writers and researchers in Jamaica and the Caribbean. Okay, so now we go to the research leg of the journey. And the one thing I can tell you, you know, he's very passionate and he's a hard task master, master. And those of us who work with him will attest to that. Yes, he doesn't give a, thank you. <laughs> so, <laughs> Professor Golding's research, which includes case studies, that's his passion, design science and diffusion technology, has been published in many journals. He has presented at numerous conferences and he's a reviewer of research, many papers, and he has authored several technical reports, and he has written numerous newspaper articles. I think there's one almost every week in one of the two newspapers. He is also the recipient of several research grants and consultancies, and is a sought-after speaker 
and has been invited to speak in several institutions across the island. He has supervised many students' research projects, and these go from the undergraduate to the doctoral level. He has also received the Utex President's Award for Excellence in Research, twice in fact, and the President's Award for Innovation, among others. He is most proud of the research that he has been doing with the deaf community, for which he has pioneered groundbreaking software to assist the deaf and that service that, that, that has held him integrally involved in UTEC. And he also was very involved in the matriculation of two deaf students who, if you were at graduation, graduated successfully last week. And he's very proud of that. Now, speaking of service, he has contributed significantly to the university, serving on the university council, academic board, and numerous other committees. He has also served externally on several boards, such as the North American Case Research Association, the Jamaica Stock Exchange, Citizens Action for Free and Fair Election Cafe, and his alma mater, Tarrant High School, among several others. He was also chair of the School of Computing's Community Service Program, and I see the skit lecturers nodding their heads there, and that program saw the school visiting several children's homes, and his service efforts also led him to establish an education foundation for needy, talented students, among many other initiatives. Now, a little bit on the personal side. Anyone here could tell me where you could find Professor Golden at 5 a.m. on a Saturday morning? You get a free book. <laughs> Sorry, too many. <laughs> yes, he's at the market. 5 a.m. on a Saturday morning, and he'll call me and he'll say, you know, things are really good down here, and I can tell you his negotiating skills were honed in that market. And he always said, if you really want to know about life in Jamaica, go speak to the people in the market. So that's where he is on a, on a Saturday morning if you want to find him. He also plays squash several times a week, and I see his partner here. And him tell us that him beat you up all the time, and it's true. Barry? Him <laughs> says. <laughs> okay. Paul, Paul's wife, Andrea Golden, to whom he had been married for 34 years, passed earlier this year. But the one thing I can tell you, she has been a huge supporter. She has been the driving force behind all, all the successes that you have heard this evening. Warm, wonderful person. And we know we, he misses her, but we all miss her. She was very instrumental in this book being published. And whenever you talk to Paul about the book, he would say, but you know, Andrea said this, and Andrea said that, and Andrea said I must do this, and Andrea said I must do that. I'm telling tales out of school. And, but um, she would have been here today, and I'm sure she would have been very proud. His son, Daniel, is a huge support, and he's here today to support his father and all his other family members, colleagues, and friends. So this is a little bit about the gentleman we're all here to celebrate with this evening, Professor Paul Golding, colleague and friend. Thank you very much, Dr. Sutherland and Dr. Facey Shaw. Now you know about the author. I wish to first congratulate those who selected the keynote speaker. An excellent choice, excellent choice. Um, Mr. Gary Allen has been a distinguished journalist, blazing a highly successful trail in the local and international media landscape. A graduate of the Caribbean Institute of Media and Communication and the Mona School of Business, UWI, he has shared his expertise and his talent in many spheres. He has served at the Caribbean Broadcasting Union, 
Caribbean Media Corporation. More recently, he has been the managing director of the RGR Communication Group. And for his sins, he was asked to be the CEO of RGR Glena Communication Group. Now, if you know the media, that's a tough rise, a real tough rise. Mr. Allen, we want to take this opportunity to congratulate you for your service in the media and for distinguishing yourself as an excellent Jamaican mentor and uh, deliverer of service to your people. Thank you very much for accepting the invitation and we look forward to hearing you delivering as keynote speaker and also a reviewer of our book, Mr. Allen. Stuff ceremonies, Hector. We go way back, you know. When I say way back, um, country way back. Uh, he knew me when I had hair. I knew him when he had black beard. So you know how far back we go. I'd like to identify chairman with your protocols and therefore not repeat them, but you will permit me to single out Prof. Golding and to specially recognize him today and to greet you well, sir. I have a few other things to say, but um, let, let's start with the greeting. I also want to pause to... Um, say hello to the family of Martin Henry. Martin was so near and dear to us in the group. And I was saying to Dr. Ivy, uh, well, well, just before we started, that we were, when Francois passed recently, we sat down and went back five years um, looking at the members of our R.J. Aglina family that we had lost, and it numbered 23 in five years. And, and so we, we have used that to learn not to take people for granted in the present and to salute people when they are here, and when they know that we salute them. And so, I will begin by saluting my friend, Prof. Paul, on the work that he has done, and to let you know that it gives me tremendous pride to have been asked to come this evening I would have been just as proud, and probably after I finish speaking, I'd probably even feel prouder if I was just sitting in the back and listening. But I have been asked to take on a task which you know that I couldn't tell you that I wouldn't want to do. So, up to earlier today, there was a very dangerous situation where I had not been given a time constraint. <laughs> and being a journalist, and knowing our reputation, I asked for guidance. Uh, true to form, Prof. Paul advised me that he was just thinking about the danger himself of not having given me a time constraint. But here, here we have it. We are here together. It has often been said, once a journalist, always a journalist. And I have always owned that as referring specifically to me, having started my media profession in journalism and having worked in no other industry in my entire life. Up to a decade or so ago, it was also said that a reporter's role is to faithfully capture the facts, 
the context and the atmosphere of what is happening around us, and to present that to the audiences fairly. Note fairly, and not objectively. And we have had this discussion with Martin. Not objectively, since most of us journalists know the age-old debate that we cannot be objective. We can only be fair. That we all have been born into biases and the things that our lived experiences tell us, the beliefs and the circumstances that we have, those are the things that give us certain biases that we don't even know exist. And that is understandable. And we can overcome those. It is distortion of facts and distortion of reality done by journalists and media workers that is a disservice to the audiences that we seek to serve. And that just took me into a whole other place because now there are challenges to the traditional way of using audiences. On the basis that today audiences are described as customers and customers of information are no longer those who we serve. And you know Jamaica has a big problem with service because they think service means servitude. Those whom we serve are no longer the ones that want to be described as that. And so in our present technological era, it's those that we engage. And when those in the audiences turn customers, receive information with which they engage, who they are and how they engage are measured in analytics, which are interrogated for targeting to create impressions. And impressions are the things that are now being monetized most in media in this new media and communications ecosystem, Prof. That is the space in which we operate. So that has led one writer in an article in 2019 to declare, once a journalist, always a journalist, is now not true. Chairman Wheeler tempted as I am to take advantage of a captive audience to get into a lively debate as journalists want to do. That was not what I was invited here to do. And so, Prof, the time frame that you have given me only starts now. <laughs> In the context of what my journalistic experience has taught me about this time of year, we normally engage in what we call the gathering of evergreen stories that we save up to use round about the Christmas and Boxing Day and days after that to the end of the year period when there is a little bit of news around. And if we are not doing that, then we are involved in the acclaimed year in review. Something that many of us loved, but some of us detested. So what does all of that have to do with what we are here about? My friend has not engaged in a year in review. He was not satisfied to take on 12 months. Well, he was not even prepared to just take on 24 months or five years, not even 10 years. Prof. Paul has decided that he will show the sterner stuff that men like him are made of. And so he has taken on the first 21 years of the 21st century. That is not a mean feat. That is stuff that you should be commended for. Congratulations, sir. The information that is contained in Prof. Paul's work is information about various sectors of our society. It's information looking at major news, current affairs, media activities, communications, political developments, telecommunications activities, technological changes, 
how they have impacted different aspects of our economies, of our lives, of how things are done and no longer done. He has produced a compact but detailed, refreshing, and exciting con contextual review of the major developments locally, regionally, and globally for the first 21 years of the 21st century. And ladies and gentlemen, what is more is that he has done this before the end of the 22nd year in the 21st century. So he wasn't hanging about doing this stuff, no lele in what he was doing at all. I salute the academic discipline, the current affairs diligence, the contextual brilliance that has been achieved in this work. Respect Jew, Prof. Golding, or as the late Honorable Barbara Gludon, one of our best community, com communicators would say, enough respect you, brethren. And she spelled her respect with a K at the end. Enough respect you, brethren. I had the privilege of reading the manuscript before Prof. headed off to the printers. He gave me a month to review it and get back to him. And in the days, the few days that I took, I thought he may have come to the view that I didn't read it. Except for the fact that I had wide-ranging comments on different aspects of almost every single area that he touched on, and I had comments and questions and expressions of my satisfaction, my delight, the things that I didn't remember, the things that came back to mind in what he had put together. And so this is a work that is one to be proud of nationally, regionally, academically, because it is something for the ages. Truth be told, Prof, it was an easy read for me. I felt like I couldn't put it down. It was like a vivid flashback program that I was engaged in when I took up the book and as I went through the different things. I thought about aspects of what I was reliving through your eyes and realized that there were things that started in one year that made a different change in another year and happened to be concluded in another decade and you captured it all together. Put it all together in one place. Sometimes there were things that happened over months and even years that in two sentences you connected all the dots and it made sense after all. The clarity with which you were able to do this made this a work that is one for not just reflections but also for how to write properly. It was history, it was current affairs, and it was documentary stuff all together. It was news, it had sports, there was economics, there was politics. In fact, I believe that in some aspects of what you have done, there are areas of things happening to the north with personalities to the north that some of the analysts that I have watched on TV night after night have not been able to unravel, but in a paragraph or two, you have put in context all that is happening and it has made ultimate sense. The other thing I want to say about the work, Prof, is that it was crisp grammar. It was excellent English. It was good use of the language. That is refreshing in our space today. The use of poor grammar by university certified honors holding graduates is a major concern for our industry. Please note, we know the difference between patois and bad English. And a patois may I talk about? I talk about people writing grammar that is not English. 
Industry and academia need to collaborate in how we will address this matter. Because the Jamaican dialect, sweet as it is, is not globally understood. And so if we are preparing people to be global citizens and to take their places all across the world, they are not going to be able to navigate it with dexterity if what they present with is pure racha patwa. The advent of the citizen journalist, whose reportage has also become a part of what is now being placed in the space of what people consume to pass judgment on things happening in their community, even before they get an explanation for it, balancing a story, that is not what we consider good journalism, but it has become a part of the standard because someone standing, sitting behind a camera, sometimes in their bedroom, looking out the window, at unmentionables hanging poorly on the line outside, as their background is passing for good, engaging television, and that is not, that is not what media standards are. Standards are exemplified by the work that you have done. Even the situation where the investigating policeman is now pronouncing in primetime news on who was at fault in a motor vehicle accident before the investigation has ostensibly started is one of the examples of where standards have fallen by the wayside. That's not what is in your work. The impact of this on grieving relatives seem not to be understood. And they seem not to even understand how that contributes to tension and to potential violence when victims believe, or victims' families believe, that there is no justice. Indeed, I find it a paradox that some law enforcement personnel and others in civil society groups, they express concern that media generally report too much crime and violence. And that may be true. And we have time afterwards to debate that one as well. I'm ready, as any journalist is, for a good debate. We can talk about the factors there. But consider the paradox. The police force has an arm dedicated with its own social media channels to presenting the gory details of every investigation of the most heinous crime and the most dastardly act, they have that available on their Twitter timelines in real time, shared with traditional media after, and then the concern about the standards in the society become when the traditional media reports what they have already shared in their social media spaces. So when you look at the impact of social media and when you look at how the technologies have presented new channels of communication and how that affects the society, Prof, those are things that it brings to the mind of the thinking person as we go through your book. Another area that I might digress into is to really just say, I think we have a problem in how we communicate in our nation. We don't talk with each other anymore. If you look at some of the things that are engagements and create impressions, and there are big, serious, sensible companies that are paying a lot of money for impressions, you know. When you look at that, you realize the challenge that we have in our society, because we have to reorient the thinking around quality and around what that quality means in terms of standards and what standards we want to maintain. So what does all of this have to do with Prof. Golding's illustrious book, The First 21 Years of the 21st Century, Observations from Jamaica? It is simply this. Prof. Paul's work is a work of high quality, 
of high standard in a space where quality work is under siege. It is a work that encapsulates some of the factors relating to those topics in the direct or the tangent, in a tangential way to things happening around us, but they are connected nonetheless. That, my friend, challenges all of us, all of us, to help Prof. Golding to travel along this otherwise lonely road by preserving quality in what we do. It challenges us to support him, as this, I predict, is only the first of quality work that he will continue to put out in the form of books. It challenges us in media and in communications, in academia and in the public service to make that push for quality work in whatever we do, in whatever sphere we are. So congratulations again, Prof. Job well done. Work well executed. Very proud of it. I'm looking forward to the sequel to this one. I have a footnote. Because it's a book, I felt that I needed to put a footnote. People in academia are about footnotes. So I have a footnote, Prof. And I don't know if you will like my footnote. If I were going to make one small suggestion to you, Prof., about the title of the book. It would be this. I know that the title is, and I can read it from the computer here, the title is The First 21 Years of the 21st Century Observations from Jamaica. That's excellent. But I would have preferred if it said Gleanings from <laughs> Jamaica. Well done, Prof. Congratulations. All the best to you. That's Gary for you. I sent Mary Man, right? You should have been from St. Thomas, but uh, okay, it's okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. Um, I think at this point, it's uh, we'd want to hear from the author, having heard about our feedback, having glanced at it, gleanings from the. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to ask you, Prof, to um, give some remarks at this time on your work, Professor Golding. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Um, thank you, thank you all for. Uh, thank you all for coming out and supporting this work. Um, thank you, Gary, for that um, very comprehensive and provocative uh, presentation, uh, in which uh, you expertly um, put in some of your own views on current events and tie them into the book. I loved it. It was, it was very good. Thank you very much. Um, uh, a number of things were said um, just now. Um, one of them had to do with um, our biases. Um, and, and we all have them, uh, regardless of how... Uh, how we think that we are objective, uh, because we are, we're really not that objective. We, we all have our biases. And I'll tell you a little bit about my biases. My early bias came from my father. 
Uh, my father was, uh, he was a shoemaker, um, but he had some strong views. He was a Pan-Africanist. Um, he thought that we as a people should have something like NATO. We should have something like the West. And there were some persons who, who we had pictures of um, in our household at the time. And if we were using present parlance, we'd say that, listen, these are the original gangsters. All right? So Joma Kenyatta picture was in our house because he was an original gangster. He wanted to change the present status quo. That, that's what he wanted to do. My father was very fond of Kwame Nkumo. Again, because of how he saw himself and how he saw us as a people. My younger brother's name is Odinga. And one of the um, Pan-Africanists, sorry, was also Odinga, Odinga from Kenya. But my, the influence not only came from within the household, the influence came from somebody else who did not necessarily describe themselves as a Pan-Africanist, but was a Pan-Africanist nonetheless. Pan-Africanism looks at um, black people as being, having similar connections culturally, historically, and so on. So he figured that we should be arm in arms. Mali took it to another level. Mali said, Arm in arms, with arms. And that's, a, that's an important distinction, you know. Because oftentimes, no change takes place without you being arm in arms and with arms. And this is from his song, Zimbabwe. Um, I think we do ourselves a disservice by not honoring Bob in a way in which we teach his music and his teachings in school. In this book, there's a lot of reference to Bob Marley because Bob had a significant impact on me as an individual and is part of my bass. That's just the way it is. Um, so I really think that Bob should be taught in schools. Um, there are some things now happening in which Bob's name is being used or songs are being used. And uh, my opinion is that he would turn in his grave. So I, I, I don't think Bob is a one love armband kind of a guy. Not that he's not looking at being inclusive and what have you. But I, I never thought of him as a, a one love armband kind of a guy. I, I really think if we don't take this up and, and use it, because listen, Bob was a genius. I don't care what anybody says. Bob was a genius. So we need to Shakespeare him or put it the other way around. Let Shakespeare know that he exists. All right? Um, so those are some of my early basses. I want to go on further to another bass. And I'd ask Lloyd McFarlane if he could take off his, his mask. Uh, Lloyd was one of my early history teachers. And I loved history. I, did, I didn't know why I love history. But it told a story. I also love law because it also told a story. But I particularly love history. But 
as a student, I, I was restless. If you didn't come to class prepared, I, I, I didn't think much of you. And Lloyd not only came to class well prepared, but he gave you this varied view of history in which history was not taught in a way in which you are supposed to just consume it, right? But you are supposed to examine it, look at the cultural, the social, the political impact of what was being done. I don't know if Lloyd know that he has this, had this kind of impact on me. <laughs> but that's what took place. Um, you helped me to be very critical about history and understand that history is no. And I'll come back to that, why I say history is no. So Lloyd had me doing that investigative part of history. And even though a lot of the history that we were taught were all lies, because of who wrote it. And it was inherently misleading. And I'm going to come back to this. So when we're talking about fake news, fake news it didn't just come now. So, I don't know how Lloyd has changed, though, you know, because, I mean, he, he, um, he know, um, or was or is, have some, some connection with the Klansman, so I, I don't know exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 listen, the, the influence, the large influence was there. <laughs> um, I want to go to another person who uh, influenced me in a way to that they may not have known. And this is Winston McKay, and if Winston can just raise his hand. Um, Winston didn't teach me directly. He, he taught me indirectly. Uh, coming out of a home of parents who were poor, but had a lot of pride. And when I'm talking about pride here, I mean, I mean teaching you what is right. Um, you can steal anything. And if you steal it, you couldn't carry it home. <laughs> and if you carry it home, you have to go carry it back. I mean, right away. I mean, I remember my sister came home with a Bible. And we are into Bible, you know, don't get me wrong. <laughs> but my mother asked, so where you got it from? And we couldn't explain, I just had to go back. Now, why this is so important is that, so you, you, you were taught these values at home, right? And then you saw the embodiment of these values in someone. You saw the person operating in a company ethically, with character, um, not just ethic in terms of doing things right, but also good work ethic. And you're saying, well, okay, this is what I was taught. And then you're seeing it happening. But you also saw the opposite of that happening. And what Winston did for me was to reinforce that which I was taught at home, and it showed that it could happen in any arena in which you could be working in an organization and you have good attitude, work ethic, um, observation of laws, and, and so on. And I want to say this, that we can teach STEM as much as we want. If what we are teaching does not change the way we behave, we are not going to get much further than where we are. If we are not teaching civility, for instance, if we are not teaching, we are being taught to 
respect rule of law, and I'm not saying to respect rule of law even when it is oppressive. When it is oppressive, you do something about it. But it shouldn't be that we do not respect any laws at all. And it is demonstrated every day that we step out of our house and go on the road. I, I want to just give you one example here, and I bring Andrea in, in here, because I can't leave her out. So we are, not, we are in Australia, and we stand up at the, we, we stand up at the, the, the pedestrian crossing, and there's a bunch of people behind us, right? And we see no traffic. We look left, we look right, and we look left. And we don't see any traffic, so we cross the road. And when we turn back and look, everybody else is still there, waiting for the light to change before they cross the road. So I held on to Andrea, and we just walk faster. <laughs> Um, I made mention today of the Japanese after they beat 2-1. Um, <clears throat> they stayed back and they cleaned the entire stadium. They cleaned the entire stadium. Um, this is a part of their culture. This is a part of a shared identity which says, listen, this is who we are. I'm saying that we have, as a people, need to know who we are. And I want to say to Winston that you have helped me to know who I am. And until we have those shared values in our society, until we have those shared values in our society, regardless of what knowledge we have, so you can teach all about STEM and everything else, but if we are not teaching about these other values, shared values in which we can, uh, we can all coalesce around, we are not going to have a society in which there is civility. Thank you, Winston. And the third person that I want to mention is Martin. Henry and his wife and first child is here. Um, Martin's role was to help me to transition from writing academic papers to writing for a different audience. And writing for these two audiences is quite different and is something that you have to learn. And then it becomes difficult, especially when you're writing for the two audiences at the same time. And then you get to the point in which you can differentiate between the two. And not only differentiate between the two, but write a piece and, then, and write it for the newspaper. And then at the same time, write it for publication. So you are able to do the two things with one piece of article. And when I decided that I wanted to write for the newspaper, Martin is who I turned to. And as you can see, Martin, has, I think this was 2019. Yes, 2019. Martin was doing this for 30 years. And that which I have done with putting my book together is something that I think Martin didn't have the time to get done because he kept writing about what was happening currently. And therefore, to stop, and this is not me now having this discussion with Martin, right? This is my hypothesis, right? That because Martin was always writing something current, it meant that he had no time to put together all that he had written in his 30 years of writing. Without Martin's help, I would not have been able to write this book. And um, although he's not here, um, I want to thank 
his family. For how willing he was to help. He was very willing to help. There, there were no ears about um, Martin. You asked him a question and he, he was just too willing to share. And without that, I would not have gotten this far in being able to write. Now, before I go to the next slide, so these are the three people that I've mentioned who have played an important role um, in what I have done. And like I say, some persons did it directly, some persons did it indirectly, but I appreciate it anyway. The, the next thing I want to do is something highly unusual. As an academic, you usually quote from works of other persons. So I'm, I'm looking now at the reasons for writing this book. You know, usually quote from other persons. So you usually quote from other researchers. But this evening, I'm quoting from scripture. I'm quoting from scripture. And this is not, this is not church. It's, this is just part of you understanding, we understanding what this life that we lead is all about. And I must tell you this, you know, my perspective on life has changed um, since my wife died on July 16. And I'm going to ask you if you could quietly just read these three verses from, for me from Ecclesiastes 1, verses 9 to 11. The, the first verse is very well known. There's nothing new under the sun. What is usually not quoted is that no one remembers the former generations, and even those yet to come will not remember by those who follow them. And this is what I have found in, sorry, before I go on to what I have found in my reading. Garvey subsequently said that a people without knowledge of their past history, origin, and culture is like a tree without roots. There's a direct connection between what Garvey says and what Ecclesi Ecclesiastic says. Now, some of you might feel uncomfortable, like these two things are not supposed to together. I mean... <laughs> But, but this, is what I, this is what I found, that the, there's all this change is taking place in this world. And every, everything seemed to be, okay, this is, this is new, unprecedented. And what we are saying here is that there is nothing new under the sun. However, what happens is that one generation does not know what took place with the other generation. And therefore, it is considered new. While it is not new, so in the book, for instance, uh, I talk about Cash Plus and the Ponzi scheme. We had, we had Ponzi scheme before at least in my lifetime. Right, Barry? But each time it comes around, it's as if, well, ah, this thing is new and I'm going to make so much money off it. And the people before us never know what really are going on. Right? And therefore, we can do this a different way. And what we have seen 
is that people, regardless of their educational level, wealth, socioeconomic conditions, still get caught up in all of this and get scammed. And it happens repeatedly. It don't just happen one time. Right? The book also looks at, for instance, the pandemic. And the pandemic, there was far too many persons who died unnecessarily because of the pandemic. But there were a lot of documentation there as to if there is another pandemic, this is what we should do. It was there. In the United States, for instance, there was this large document that was there, but it was done by the other government. So politics and ideology came into all of this and blurred the whole thing, and therefore, a lot of persons died unnecessarily. So what I, one of the things, one of the main themes in the book is that things may not be the same, but they're very similar. And if we refuse to learn from our history, we are destined to repeat it. And this sounds almost cliche, but it is not. This is what actually happens. So, um, the, the book also looked at the emergence of new media. So it looked at social media. And what, was, what we see happening now with social media is supposed to be new. Again, the answer to that is no. Um, when the printing press came around, all kinds of fake news, it, they weren't called fake news then, they were called propaganda. But now we have changed the term so that it seems new. Same old term. I've been given the wrap-up sign. The, 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 the book covers a wide range of, of areas. Um, and they are all looked at from a Jamaican perspective. It was said that we are a culture that does not document things. This is part of the documentation to say, listen, these are the issues that occurred in the first 21 years of the 21st century. And we should be able to look back at it and use it as a means of going forward because the past is in the present. It is not separate. The past, I want to say that again, is in the present. Ladies and gentlemen, I trust that you'll all buy several copies of this book. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Author, Professor Paul Golding. I know we have heard a lot from the podium uh, this afternoon, this evening, and we have on the program opportunity for a few questions. Should you have any special questions, burning questions that you would like to pose before we leave, you may ask them now. There is a microphone right um, to my left here. If you have a question, could you please use the microphone? No question? Okay. Well, if you have no question now, you can ask the questions later 
while we're having refreshment, I'm sure. The, the next order of business is the unveiling of the, the book. So Dr. Ivy, um, I'll ask you to supervise this. All right, with the unveiling of the book. Our cameramen and women <laughs> well, the editor makes her way here. We'd also like to thank the, um, the company, Caribbean Producers Jamaica Limited, for their kind support to this event. Ladies and gentlemen, the moment we have been waiting for. It gives me great pleasure to unveil for you the first 21 years of the 21st century. Here it is. Thank you very much. And afterwards, when we have finished the formalities, we're going to ask you to please come and sign your messages of congratulations to Professor Golden. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ivy. Before we leave, I'm going to ask um, Mr. Oran Cater to make. Um, uh, what, what I'd like to do is to make four presentations. Um, first, I want to present a copy of the first 21 years of the 21st century to Martin's family. And I'd like Mrs. Henry to join us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm not really sorry. <laughs> <laughs> on behalf of the UTEC Jamaica Press, um, on, on my behalf as the author, I'd really like to present this book to you. Um, and just to acknowledge the work that Martin has done, uh, I, I think that I've become a, my scope has become broader because of Martin. Uh, not just the help in, in writing, but my scope has become broader because of Martin. All right? Thank you very much for sharing him with us and sharing with Jamaica, not just with us. 
All right, thank you very much. Yes. The, the next presentation I'd like to make is for the, the person that we, we call Munchi. I, I want to make this presentation to Lloyd Klansman, um, <laughs> McFarlane, um, the, the person who opened my mind, who, who caused me to be very analytical. In my examination of not just history, but for everything else. Thank you very much. Could I say a word? Sure. I'm going to be very brief. I want to indicate to you that I was not a teacher. I was a student at the law school and went to teach history and English at Excelsior High School at the extension. And the headmaster was a gentleman called Van Hitchener. And in the first week when I came there, he told me that the classes had reported that I was using military tactics because I suggested that they had to stand before the start of each class. The next week he said to me, they're all trying to get into your class now. Don't let anyone in because we don't have the space. I said, fine. Some weeks later he said to me, there is one very special student. I need to have him in your history class because he's really very good. I'm so glad he went into my history class. Thank you, Munchi. <laughs> uh, the, the next presentation I want to make is to Winston McKay, Reverend McKay. Uh, Reverend McKay spoke at, was the MC at, you know, at my, uh, no, you were MC also at the wedding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so we don't go 25th yet. <laughs> he was MC at our wedding. He was MC at our 25th wedding anniversary. Um, uh, he spoke at Andrea's funeral, uh, and he has been my character builder, the, the person who helped to reinforce what my parents had taught me, that this is what ethics is, this is what good be behavior is. Not, not that I was always good behaving, <laughs> because what Munshi didn't tell you is that the reason I was asked to get into his class is because I was not happy with the other class because um, um. <laughs> So um, Winston, thank you very much for being in our lives for all this time. Yes. I will be very brief. He was trying to change lane this morning on Trafalgar Road. I let him in. <laughs> I, I'm running late this morning for an interview. Right? And I'm, I'm in the wrong lane. And I pull up beside this person to ask them if I could change lane. And only for him to wind down the window. <laughs> um, there... <laughs> Uh, there, I say that I, I, I got to my interview with 15 minutes to spare. Um, the other presentation that I want to make is to our guest speaker, Gary Allen.
uh, over the years, um, I have grown very close to Gary. When this book was first written and the advanced copy was put out, I asked Gary uh, if, he could give, if he could read and give me feedback, um, which, which he did. Um, his presentation today was overly flattering. I'm, I'm not sure <laughs> what was the objective, but it was... <laughs> <laughs> you wanted a copy. <laughs> so, uh, what I want to say is that your objective has been achieved. So. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And, so very much. and congratulations. Thank Excellent you. Stuff. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, those are the presentations that I've wanted to make to um, the, the, the persons who have really impacted my journey in this aspect uh, so very significantly. Thank you very much. We can now have Mr. Oren Cato. Hi, good evening all. So my name is Oran Cato. Um, I'm a part of the sponsoring team outside CPJ. I'm the category man manager of wines at CPJ. I'm also a past student of Dr. Golding. At that time, he was neither doctor nor professor. He was just Paul Golding. Um, he has been, so, History, I attended 2000 to 2004. Yes, you're not that old. Um, so um, he was my IT um, lecturer, tutor. But over the years, he, he became more than just tutor, lecturer. He became mentor. And I want to say he borderline father. Uh, we became very close, um, somehow convinced me to play squash. Started playing squash as well, and we went through the rigors. Um, truth be told, over the years, we have not been as close in terms of communication as we have been in the past, but nonetheless, we have always been a phone call away, and whenever he needs to bounce something, he does, and whenever I need to bounce something, he does. Whenever he's having any event, he always calls. <laughs> so um, I just wanted to give uh, Professor Dr. Paul Golding a, a, a token um, uh, for this book. Um, I've not read one. I saw, I believe, five books being given out. <laughs> No one has to ask what the objective is here. <laughs> um, but um, Paul, um, this is for you from, not just me, but from the CPJ family. So on my team, there's three of us that he actually taught. So it's not just me alone, it's three of us that were from UTEC. Uh, well, I'm defending one book. The other two persons are here to defend for themselves, but I'll act on their behalf. So Paul. Um, on, the, uh, on behalf of myself, Roja, and Kemar, I'd like to present this to you. Yeah. <laughs> Don't leave. Objective achieved. This book is for Roja, <laughs> yourself, and Kamar. <laughs> and I'm going to sign it, all right? Thank you very much, um, Mr. Cato and Professor Golden and all the recipients. We have come to the end of the evening. It's been quite enjoyable. It's a fruitful affair. Um, it's a celebratory affair. And uh, it's now time 
to meet and mingle outside with some refreshments courtesy of um, Caribbean <laughs> producers. And I understand Lillian's is part of the fair. Uh, there will be an opportunity for book signing just outside the lecture theater. Uh, I want to say thank you again for being such a great audience for our, to our keynote speaker who took the time out of what we all normally say a very busy schedule, but I can tell you in the media, it's a hectic schedule. So I'm impressed that you have taken time out. We are impressed also uh, by your presentation, and we hope to see you around sometime soon, Gary. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Ivy, and thank you to all the others, the, the, the LTSU team, and so many other persons that work together from COBAM. And I don't want to, it's an inexhaustive list, but I want to make you feel appreciated for what you have done to make it such a pleasant evening. We will have drinks and celebrate outside. Thank you. One other thing, guys, um, the, the book, um, in order to purchase a copy of the book, there are some QR codes outside in which you can just scan, and from there, you can purchase online, and we will be able to, to acknowledge the payment and do a signed copy for you. And if you don't want to do it now, you can do it after, all right? Thank you. Enjoy the cocktails outside, please.